Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tom Kowalski, and I'm the president and CEO of THBI, the Texas Healthcare and Bioscience Institute. THBI is a public policy organization whose members include companies, research institutions, economic developers, chambers of commerce, those organizations and institutions that make up the Texas life science industry. I would like to thank Dr. Schlesinger and Dr. Turner and uh, their team at Texas Biomedical Research Institute in San Antonio for their help in this production today. Today our discussion is COVID-19 and an example of what a Texas institution is doing to find a cure for the virus. And as you can see by the attached slide, the life science industry in Texas is very robust uh, with over 5,500 life science companies. COVID-19 is bringing together innovative ideas, swift actions and clinical trials, and the need for equipment and materials to keep our country safe. After the presentation, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions via the chat mode uh, on your screen. And before I introduce Dr. Schlesinger, I would like to thank Representative Steve Allison and Representative Ray Lopez for joining us today. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Schlesinger. Uh, he is a medical doctor, an internationally recognized authority in infection diseases. He began his distinguished scientific leadership career after joining the faculty at the University of Iowa in 1991, where he served as fellowship director for the Division of Infectious Diseases and Associate Chair of the Department of Medicine. He moved to the Ohio State University in 2002, where he served as the director of the Division of Infectious Diseases, Department of Internal Medicine until 2011, when he became first chair of the Microbial Infection and Immunity. During his tenure, he founded the Center for Microbial Interface Biology, a board of trustees approved university-wide center with a focus on infectious diseases of concern to public health. Dr. Schlesinger grew the program from infancy to more than 180 faculty and a staff with more than 62 million in grant funding. In 2017, he became president and CEO of Texas Biomedical Research Institute in San Antonio and is leading a transformational change process. Uh, Dr. Schlesinger is a practicing scientist who has trained more than 170 individuals just in his research lab. His passion lies in the development of people and programs that will have revolutionary impact on human health for years to come. He is known for his effective leadership style, development of innovative programs, and the concept of team science. Dr. Schlesinger, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I will turn this over to you. Thank you very much, Tom, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's really good to be virtually with you, uh, all of you today. Thank you for joining us. Tom, I want to thank you and THBI for your continued support and for allowing us today to uh, talk to everyone uh, um, via this um, video conference uh, describing the unique value that I believe Texas Biomedical Research Institute brings to the state of Texas, uh, and particularly to talk about all of our efforts going on with the current pandemic. These are indeed extraordinary times. I also want to thank our state uh, legislators for their leadership in guiding us through this extraordinary experience uh, during this pandemic. In the couple of minutes uh, that I have, um, I want to give you a high-level overview of Texas Biomedical Research Institute for people who are less familiar with us, uh, and then uh, turn this over to Dr. Turner, who will be uh, more specifically focused on the science and on our uh, research projects regarding COVID-19 in the race for cures. So if I could have the next slide, please. So uh, Texas Biomedical Research Institute is an independent, uh, not-for-profit uh, research institute. Uh, with a long history of collaborating with partners worldwide, we currently have over 250 partners worldwide to develop uh, innovative uh, breakthroughs in biomedicine. And we've actually been contributing to the world of science and health for nearly 80 years. Next year will be our 80th uh, year anniversary. Since coming uh, to the Institute as a leader in 2017, we've um, transformed the Institute with a new mission and vision, which I hope uh, makes a clearer message to the world, which is we're here to pioneer and share scientific breakthroughs that protect you, your families, and our global community from the threat of infectious diseases. So you can see that the current COVID-19 uh, pandemic underscores the importance of our Institute's mission and has very quickly galvanized a scientific team of over 30 individuals 
uh, and engaged a large number of Institute supporters to mobilize resources quickly, and I'll come back to that, to aid the world in the race for cures for COVID-19. Um, Texas Biomed, uh, through its efforts in COVID-19, is clearly capitalizing on its strengths that include outstanding collaborative scientists and our unique assets and resources, which I'm going to identify in just a slide or two. But I thought I would just step back for just a minute for the next slide and, uh, and, and talk about what's at stake. And uh, Lisa, if you could. Um, so what is at stake? I want everybody to know this, that infectious diseases are increasing, in fact, constituting more than a quarter of all deaths worldwide annually. And it's been estimated by one uh, leading economist that it takes infectious diseases will be the number one killer of humans by 2050. You know, outbreaks of infectious disease have tripled since 1980. And our challenges are compounded by the fact uh, that we now have these so-called superbugs that are resistant to our current uh, antimicrobials, the current treatments for infectious disease. And that's becoming a challenge even now, you can see with COVID-19. COVID-19 also tells us that each and every individual uh, is susceptible to an infectious disease at some point uh, in their lifetime. No one, in fact, is spared. And, uh, and I'll come back to that point as well. And finally, that we have an increasing susceptible population to infectious diseases. Did you know that there is a higher percentage of individuals over age 65 uh, in the, uh, on, in the globe, on the globe today than there ever has been? There's 7.4 billion people on the planet. And the elderly are particularly susceptible to infectious diseases as only one population to focus on, uh, but there are others. Next slide, please. So uh, Texas Biomed actually has several unique resources for the state of Texas and for the nation. So we have the only privately owned biocontainment level four facility uh, in the country. The others are federal labs. And this is a lab that's been operated uh, for nearly 20 years uh, and uh, allows us to study the most infectious agents that have no cure. And I'll come back to this as well because we've done a lot of work over the decades with Ebola virus. We also have five fully outfitted biocontainment level three facilities. One step down, these are highly infectious agents that have cures, but they're still very uh, uh, difficult to work with. And we have to uh, be, have proper PPE to work with the infectious agents there. The Biocontainment 4 lab is the so-called spacesuit lab for those who know it affectionately through perhaps some movies. We also cohabitating on our campus, we're one of seven national primate research centers, and we're distinguished by having the broadest array of non-human primates uh, and, uh, and uh, to study for human health. Uh, we have the largest, for example, uh, marmoset colony. These are small New World monkeys that are tractable and they're very popular right now for aging studies. And we also have the only baboon uh, population in the country for studies of human health and disease. Collectively, these assets exist nowhere else in the country. Uh, and uh, in fact, we resemble no other private organization in the country. Everybody else looks like a government, that looks like us as a government laboratory, yet we have business practices. So we practice efficiency, effectiveness, customer service on time under budget, hopefully. We also um, have uh, a public purpose uh, that's big, uh, not only in our, our race for cures for infectious disease and improvement of human health, but also because we have a large educational footprint. We train K through 12, undergraduate, graduate students, and postdocs. Um, we have strong partnerships with our other uh, large institutions in the city. Uh, we train graduate students at UTSA who are from UTSA and UT Health San Antonio, for example. And we have another, uh, uh, other examples of important partnerships with these other institutions in the city. So we do view ourselves as an asset, as a partner for, um, uh, for others, and not only in the city, but in the region and the state. Next slide, please. So um, we have several successes that some of you may know about, many of you probably don't know about. So the Institute has worked for decades with governmental agencies, particularly in HHS, both NIH and BARDA. In fact, this later this year will become a prime for BARDA. We've also had contracts with the Department of Defense and a number of other public and private partnerships. We also are known for performing what is called GLP practice science. This is regulatory science 
that is required in a portfolio for the FDA. So the FDA knows us well. And through these uh, processes, we actually played an instrumental role in bringing the hepatitis B, va B vaccine that you use when you travel uh, to market through the work we've done with chimpanzees. They're no longer used for science, but uh, we did that work. We also were very involved uh, in uh, primate research that led to the current cures for hepatitis C. And our most current success, working closely with Regeneron and other companies, have brought the new antibody therapy uh, for Ebola to the Democratic Republic of Congo, as you might know, is the current outbreak for Ebola. And finally, this drug is bringing the death rate uh, under control uh, in the Congo. And I'm very proud of that for our scientists at Texas Biomed. The Texas Biomed is expanding in the context of COVID-19, a number of its commercial partnerships with large pharma and vaccine companies. To name a few, we're in close uh, negotiations now with Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, Sanofi, Regeneron, MAP Biopharmaceuticals, and many of those agencies are also working closely with BARDA. So um, we are capitalizing our, our unique assets and our outstanding science to bring cures uh, in the current uh, context to COVID-19. Those are the high level, um, I, by the way, on this slide before I leave it, you can also see that we have a large footprint uh, for diagnostic therapies and vaccines for tuberculosis. We have um, uh, outstanding science in our uh, battle against uh, drug resistant malaria. And what we're also known for is our uh, animal models that we've brought forward for the HIV, Zika, Ebola, tuberculosis, hepatitis, and others. So we're particularly well known for animal models, which will come back to our research on COVID. But with that very quick overview, I'd like to introduce uh, my uh, close colleague, Dr. Joanne Turner. And let me introduce her briefly. Dr. Turner is our Vice President research, uh, for Research, and as such, she oversees all research operations at Texas Biomedical Research Institute. She also, like me, is an active scientist uh, uh, performing studies on the immune system and tuberculosis, and her particular expertise is in the aging population, its effects on inflammation, immunity, and tuberculosis. She received her PhD in immunology from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and I was very fortunate to recruit her as my colleague as VP in 2017, the same year that I arrived. We have known each other for about 17 years now, and we're colleagues at Ohio State University uh, before coming to Texas Biomed. She also currently serves as the executive director uh, for the San Antonio Vaccine Development Center, and this is a citywide program advancing vaccines uh, through a number of partners in our city. And with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Joanne. Thank you very much for that um, introduction. I'm really pleased to be here and present in these unusual circumstances. Uh, and I'll provide you some more information about what we're specifically doing at Texas Biomed in response to COVID-19. Um, we have been obviously aware of this growing pandemic uh, for many, many months. Uh, and what we first did was form a team of really skilled scientists that are at Texas Biomed. Um, and we are really fortunate to have some outstanding virologists on our campus, many of which have been working with Ebola or other viral pathogens. Um, and those include Dr. Jean Patterson, uh, Luis Giovedani, Ricardo Carrion, and Luis Martinez Brito. Um, and then part of that team, we also brought in our uh, primate center director, Dr. Deepak Kushal, who is helping us with animal studies, uh, and Dr. Jordi Carellas, who's really been our facilitator for all the research. And this team has been responding to every inquiry at Texas Biomed who would like to work with us. Um, and it's also been the driver of our own internal studies uh, where we've raised funds to support some initial studies. The team is much bigger. Obviously, for our campus to run studies with COVID-19, we need biocontainment labs, uh, BSL-3 labs. So we have environmental health and safety. We have animal care staff. Uh, biocontainment program staff to make sure facilities run. We have to have really good maintenance of uh, facilities on our campus and we need money, obviously, through our financial support and obviously through Lisa, we have a lot of media support to help us really publicize what we're doing. If I could have the next slide. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so Texas Biomed uh, really has three major programs on its campus, which are the focus of our research primarily on infectious disease, but we also work on those underlying conditions that lead to susceptibility to infection, whether that's diabetes, increasing age, heart disease, obesity, all of those are very relevant for COVID-19 studies. Uh, and we 
into these three programs that uh, really have helped us formulate how we work on this viral pathogen. So host pathogen interactions is really where we look at that basic biology of the virus and how it interacts and affects cells in our bodies. Uh, disease intervention and prevention is really where the major focus is for us, where we're looking at the ability to develop uh, vaccines and therapeutics for COVID-19. And then population health is where we start thinking about that, how the infection spreads across communities, uh, which means people. Uh, but it also means how the virus might adapt to being uh, within different human populations. I can have the next slide, thanks. Thank you. Um, so what we're doing at Texas Biomed is really taking advantage of many things that we have on our campus. One is obviously the uh, incredible BSL-3 facilities that we have. The other is the population of non-human primates that we have on our campus that we can use, uh, the virologist expertise, um, and the fact that we're quite nimble uh, with regard for compliance, which means that we can take a study from uh, the initial formulation all the way through to all the approvals we need to work safely with animals and infectious diseases and we can do regulated studies to make sure what we're doing is really robust. So this is a brand new virus. It has similarities to some we know already, but the first thing we needed to do was obtain the virus and grow stocks in the lab so that we could actually do really rigorous science that was reproducible. And so we did obtain that virus. It has been grown in our labs. We started growing that about two or three weeks ago. Uh, we actually sequenced the virus to make sure it didn't have any deletions in it that would change how it might interact in our animal models. And that's all been done and compared to other groups that are studying the same viral pathogen. Uh, and then what we really needed to do, besides just understand the virus, uh, is work out how we can actually measure whether vaccines and therapeutics work against it. And to do that, we have to have an animal model, uh, a model that as best replicates human disease as we can. Uh, and when we think about animal modeling, we can use rodents, such as mice or guinea pigs, but really the species that's the most similar to us are non-human primates. And we're fortunate on our campus to have three different species in abundance, uh, the baboons, rhesus macaques, and marmosets. Um, so actually the next slide would be great. Thank you. Uh, so as I said, we began growing the virus a few weeks ago. Uh, we completed all our documentation. And then we started a study where we compared three different non-human primate models. Again, the marmoset, baboon, and rhesus macaque. Those studies are ongoing. Uh, infections have been initiated and we're now sampling those animals and studying them by imaging uh, and other kind of isolation of tissues to understand the viral uh, infection uh, and to see whether that replicates what we see in humans. And in humans we're looking for uh, a broad spectrum of outcomes so some of our animals will recover very quickly and some may go on and be sick and that's what really we're really looking for. And we're adding into our model another variable, not just three species, and hoping that one of those ends up being really the best model for human disease. Uh, we're adding in the um, addition of increasing age, and so we're looking at animals that are younger and we're looking at animals that are older, because we do know that uh, as we increase in age, we're more likely to get sicker uh, with COVID-19. So Thank you. So this is what we have ongoing. Our animals, uh, our non-human primates are infected. Their work's in progress. We're getting some really nice data. But we're still also looking at other avenues of research. Uh, one of the things that we'd like to do is have a smaller animal model as well as a non-human primates. Obviously a mouse or a guinea pig is much easier to work with. We can do things quicker. Uh, and we can screen vaccines and therapeutics in a very robust way before we put those into non-human primates. And so one of our virologists is working to uh, infect mice and guinea pigs um, with SARS coronavirus 2, which is the name of the virus, uh, and then reinfect and reinfect until that virus adapts to living in a rodent. Uh, and that allows us to study it in a model that it's actually capable of infecting. Uh, it's a great model for screening uh, vaccines and drugs. The other thing that we can do is use a mouse model that's been adapted to be infected by the virus. And this has been done by others and we can acquire those mice. And then we can again use that to screen against the actual uh, virus that we've been growing in our lab. Um, so those are some of the studies that are about to get started in small animal models. We also have many other things that we're in the process of establishing. One is to really look closer about this link between increasing age and susceptibility to COVID-19 and studies are proposed and submitted to funding agencies with the hope that they'll fund those projects. Uh, we're working with a lot of different industry partners, as Larry also uh, already told you about, um, who want to test vaccines and drugs in the animal model when we 
um, eventually decide which model is the best model to do that. And then there's lots of other studies of individuals coming to us wanting to test um, skin creams, uh, decontamination protocols, disinfection uh, protocols, whether SARS uh, coronavirus 2 uh, impacts pregnancy or heart disease. There's all these links with some of these, um, what you're hearing in the news for some of the susceptibility traits. And so we're working on a lot of those studies as well. Uh, and we're also working locally with our partners at UT Health on pilot studies uh, to really understand both the virus, but also the uh, outcome of the infection. I think that's my last slide. Yes, back to Larry. Thank you, Joanne. Um, and let me, this is my last slide as well. So I wanted to summarize uh, uh, from my perspective uh, uh, some of the challenges we face um, as we go forward. So um, I hope I don't need to convince the audience, the public, anymore that it's not a matter of if the next outbreak or pandemic, but when. Uh, this is the third coronavirus outbreak. There will be a fourth. I suspect this virus seems quite adaptable and there'll be others. After 34 years in infectious diseases, I have personally been through several of these. And if I go back to some of the TV slots I've done many years ago, it seems like I'm repeating myself with the current pandemic with regard to our desire to do it better and differently, but we're having a difficult time learning that. The other thing that this pandemic tells us is there's an absolute close link between infectious diseases, social aspects of society, and the economy. A direct link among all of them, and that is always the case. I've already made the point that we have an increase in susceptible populations, but I also want to comment that what we really do need to do is to develop a better sustainable strategy going forward that fundamentally converts us from reactive to proactive. Starting on you know, therapies and cures in the setting of a crisis is never a good thing. And you're always going to be late and take time as it will to bring these uh, new drugs and vaccines to market. Uh, what we need is a different strategy, one that thinks forwardly about finishing therapies, finishing vaccines, stockpiling them, having more redundancy and depth in our PPE and other uh, tools necessary for healthcare workers and be ready. And this is really about a public will uh, to understand the threat better and to be able to sustain that message over the long haul. And remember, infectious disease infects everyone and it spares no one. And it's not just the impact of the infection itself, but the fact that infections can trigger inflammation, which can trigger a variety of other diseases, cancer, heart disease, rheumatic diseases, et cetera. So there's a, no, a lot of things we need to learn about infectious diseases. Well, we have resource needs. Joanne's brought that up. I'll bring it up again. One resource need is, I think, something we do exceptional at Texas Biomed through Lisa and her team, which is public awareness and engagement in science. We need to do more of what we're doing right now, which is informing everyone about what infectious diseases really are. We need to understand exactly what the steps are to move from bench and innovation to the market. It's not a one stop. In the, if you listen to the news, it's like we discovered a vaccine today and it'll be on the market tomorrow. And it obviously does not work that way. We are looking to streamline those processes. And frankly, the vision of Texas Biomed is to have a one stop shop. So our campus is 200 acres. We have a master plan and our goal is to actually cohabitate non-for-profit and for-profit in the infectious disease space so we can work more quickly and more streamlined and perhaps more cost-effective in uh, moving this forward. Uh, there is discussion of vaccine centers, uh, uh, lab, or, or, um, uh, warehouses, et cetera. Um, science is collaborative. I think this is, tells us that it is, it is a public-private partnership. We need to engage pharma, academia, military, government, nonprofits are all in the game. We need to be talking to each other, absolutely critical. And then in understanding that this is all very expensive. Now, one of the things I wanna tell you is that we launched our animal studies th two weeks ago uh, now, uh, and we're just putting starting to put results together because we engaged our uh, private sector partners and in the course of seven days, we raised $3.8 million to initiate our studies. Now with those studies has come a lot more business. So this is what I call SOS, the struggles of success. So we now are moving to next stage needs, which are to increase capacity. And so this costs money and we're in the middle of uh, assessing that now and uh, moving forward with our partners. 
and hopefully with other partners like government partners and other uh, um, areas of Texas uh, to engage in our efforts. Uh, so uh, there's um, a lot going on uh, at Texas Biomed. Uh, and I think I want to bring this, turn this over to Tom and end by saying, be safe, everyone. Practice social distancing, wash your hands uh, and ask questions. Uh, be safe. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. And Tom, it's back to you. Thank you, Larry, and thank you for those presentations. You know, one of the things we'd like to do uh, this afternoon is, is uh, through Q&A, we'd like to have a brief policy discussion because I think that there's things that we can learn. You could break it up into pre-COVID, uh, prior to uh, COVID uh, descending upon us. Uh, we had traveled the state. Uh, we had a number of roundtables with a number of executive and academic institutions. Uh, at that time, it was tuition revenue bonds, uh, providing uh, facilities to train the next generation of, of workers. Workforce needs were there, venture capital needs. I think now as we're into COVID, a number of the calls uh, that we at THBI have been receiving, it's been for money. Uh, I know that a number of our companies are looking for money that are in the COVID space, uh, either going into animal or clinical trial testing. Uh, it has been materials. There's been a number of hospitals and institutions looking for uh, protective gear. And, and of course, it's been matchmaking. Uh, who, who knows what's going on where? How do, we, how do we match up? As we look at post-COVID, how can we take lessons learned? And we can look at the environment moving forward. What's going to happen? We have post-COVID, we have elections on a federal and state level. Post-COVID, we're going to have budgetary issues that are going to be facing our state. Post-COVID, uh, we're going to have redistricting facing the legislature. And then what happens with the lessons that we have learned? And I think that there's some valuable things that we can begin to discuss and possibly put in place, such as an emergency fund. The dollars that we have been dealing with have been less than a million, uh, a minimum of 150000 So we're not talking about large amounts of dollars to help move these companies forward. So uh, these are some of the issues that I think, uh, and Larry, I have to agree with you, uh, you know, to bring a drug to the marketplace, it's a good 12 to 18 months. It's a good 2.4 to $2.8 billion. It is not inexpensive. And so we have resources in Texas. Uh, we have uh, facilities such as yours. Uh, there is a lot that we can do as we move forward post COVID. Uh, and I'll just, I'll close with those remarks. I know that we may have some questions. Um, Lisa, how do we want, do we have anybody that, that has a question that needs to be asked? I, excuse me, I do not have any in the chat function. So if someone uh, has a question, um, please feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask away. I will just add on, uh, uh, Tom, before the first question that um, in thinking about uh, pharma, um, the question that always comes up is we work, we spend a quarter of a billion or, or more uh, to bring something to market. You said 2.5 billion. Uh, but then it's a question of what's the shelf life. And we need to uh, be looking at incentives uh, and uh, partnerships uh, that allow for a company to see the value. And a lot of companies are now coming into COVID-19. That's fantastic. But is it sustainable? That's a question. Mm -hmm. All right, do we have any questions from those that are participating? Anything with regard to COVID-19 in general? Larry, when do you think the timeline is? When do you think we might see something, whether it's a vaccine, a therapeutic? And I know, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but uh, what do you see? You know, I, I, there's off-the-shelf experiments going on right now. That is with, uh, you know, hydroxychloroquine has been in the news a lot. And uh, those types of clinical trials are moving along now. So more and more people are involved in those trials at a couple of different places. And if, in fact, proven to be effective, that may be the quickest way to get something uh, out there. But in terms of anything new, um, our own um, animal models, along with a uh, few other labs uh, who are doing uh, primate studies around the world um, will be done in the next, you know, 30 days. We'll have models. The models will be there. I feel confident the models will be there. 
Uh, but, uh, you know, phase one has moved, has gone to the races. That's good. That's safety. That's 40 to 50 people. But phase two and three needs to be carried on much larger numbers, more arms to the study, more expense. And I think we can cut some corners by working in the animal models in parallel, not sequential. We can be trying to do everything together. Uh, but I think any way you look at it, the number 12 to 18 months for me, uh, being in the business, incredibly fast. So there might be some stumbling blocks along the way. Uh, the energy is there. My hope is we do move that quickly. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll do our part uh, to move as quickly as we can and help companies who need some of those data uh, for the FDA in addition to the clinical studies. Okay. We do have a question. How do you see the post-COVID policy development around proactive PrEP going forward? We've been screaming this for decades. Do you think this will be a true wake-up call or will we fall back to old habits? So, uh, Tom, did you want to answer that first or do you want me to answer that? Go ahead, Larry. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm not getting younger. And, uh, you know, I think Dr. Fauci, who my good colleague I've known for many, many years, is doing a really good job at, at the end, of, towards the end of his career now, he's front and center, on really singing that song of uh, having to not, uh, to guard against uh, when it moves out of the news that it's out of everyone's mind. Um, so um, I think people like myself uh, are really on a mission to engage the public uh, and spend any waking time we can to continue to provide facts um, to the public about the impact of infectious diseases and what it means to them as an individual. So bringing it, personalize it for the individual to understand why do I need to care? Uh, and, um, and I'm hopeful, you know, I'm a hopeful person, but I'm hopeful because of the fact that we've shut down the world economy with this particular pandemic, that people will remember. And uh, as Dr. Fauci said, the world will never be the same. Well, that may be a good thing because it'll be a wake up call and allow uh, for more efforts, sustainable efforts to go on. What does that look like? I've already mentioned, I think we need to finish the job so, so we don't have a SARS vaccine because it dried up. We never finished the job of the SARS vaccine. It's been dusted off and is one of the vaccines being looked at now. We need to finish the vaccines, get them ready, get them approved by the FDA and get them stockpiled. We need these new therapies to be tested in clinical trials and those that work need to be uh, uh, we need to have enough of it to be prepared for the next one. There is the, there is the possibility for a science perspective to have a universal coronavirus vaccine. There is, just like there's efforts, and we've recruited someone recently from Rochester to work on the universal influenza vaccine. So um, I think there's new science, there's new technology, engaging public private sector and engaging the public. Um, we can turn this around um, and then I think it's about innovative strategies that include a campus like Texas Biomed, which because it's an, a, an independent freestanding can move more quickly and has more flexibility uh, to really think about uh, the pipeline uh, better. Um, and uh, you know, I would love to partner with the state government uh, more than I do today uh, because I view Texas Biomed as a resource for the state, uh, is an opportunity for us to lead in this area. We have huge problems in South Texas uh, and throughout our big cities in infectious diseases. We need to tackle that. Another question has come in. How can your elected officials, particularly at a state or federal level, help Texas Biomed? Well, I like, well, Larry, obviously I have a comment, but it's about Texas Biomed. So please take this one. But I'd like to respond as well. Please, why don't you start uh, and then I'll follow you. Well, you're awfully kind, thank you. You know, it, it, as Larry had mentioned, it does take education. I, you know, our elected officials today are so busy and I think that the complexities of, of running a state are so huge, particularly as large as Texas. Uh, that also being a border state and the problems that, that, and the challenges that we have. I think it takes education, uh, and that is one thing that we at THBI are attempting to do. How do we educate legislators? How do we educate staff? In terms of what the processes are, uh, uh, if you tour uh, Texas Biomed, it is just a fascinating tour 
uh, from the employees that, that Larry has on the ground all, all the way through to the laboratories and the experiments that are being conducted. It's like this all across the state of Texas. We have some amazing facilities. And we have uh, over 228,000 employees all going to work every day uh, trying to make Texas and America a better place. Uh, we had a conversation this morning uh, with the Association of British Healthcare Industries that are located in London. We were comparing notes uh, and it's uh, uh, the, the same things that are going on here in central Texas, uh, they're experiencing the same things in London, downtown London. And you know, for us, uh, we all agree that innovation is moving at warp speed. Collaborations are moving at warp speed. And you think about the what if factor, if we lived in a perfect world. And so uh, it's gonna continue to be education and the knowledge of what it takes to bring a drug or a vaccine or a medical device. You know, and ventilators today uh, fall into that same category and the race to create more ventilators. But we are witnessing, despite all of the, uh, the dark times that are going on, we're witnessing uh, an amazing revelation in innovation in terms of what can be done. That's my comment. Yeah, I, I just would put a dot on that, on that eye there. That's w very well said, Tom. And, you know, I am new to Texas and uh, came here strategically uh, because I think the state has so much to offer the country and the world. Um, and, you know, I came out of 34 years at medical schools and now run a freestanding institute for a reason. And that is because I believe that we can move things without bureaucracy quicker because I want to help people. What I, what, I, what I think about waking up in the morning is how can we do better? Um, and how can we move things along to patients better? Uh, and, uh, and I think, um, although we're not a university, we're not a you know, re research university enterprise where a lot of focus is, um, entity, you know, entities like Texas Biomed do not occur in other parts of the country. I want people in Texas to know that. Um, this is really a unique enterprise and one ideally positioned uh, in the realm of infectious diseases. But I think we also have many more opportunities to partner. Uh, and I uh, recently, you know, I've been on the phone, folks at UT Southwestern, Texas A&M, UT Austin. And you know there are things we can complement on, things we can do in a business sense differently than what the mission of an academic university is. But let's capitalize on that. Let's realize that and let's find a way to enact it. Um, I think ideas get hashed over a lot, but how can you implement and I think be a showcase, actually be a leader in changing the, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the story about infectious diseases I think Texas has all the elements. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, people like to collaborate well. Um, there's a lot of good conversation going on, uh, but there's a lot at stake. I mean, there are a lot of people losing their lives as we speak here on this call. And that's real to me. Uh, I know the first time I traveled to India as a tuberculosis researcher, that's real to me. People are dying every day. 1.5 million people die of tuberculosis every year. Uh, you know, so um, we have ongoing challenges. Uh, we need to do better. We clearly need to do better and we need to invest more in this arena and understand the links between infectious diseases, for example, and cancer and heart disease and other diseases. Diabetes, we have plenty of diabetes in the state of Texas. Diabetics, by and large, have a lot of problem with their wounds and infectious diseases. Sepsis, still the number one killer in this country in hospitalized patients. So we have a number of challenges and we need to start having conversation in real ways to help, um, to help people. Ann, did you have a question or a comment? Yes, thank you. Did, did you unmute me? <laughs> I did. Okay, great. Well, I just thought of another, it's, it's more of just an informational uh, item that just came to my attention the last couple of days that another one of our San Antonio institutions, uh, which is known uh, as BioBridge Global, they um, have run the community blood bank, a blood and tissue bank here for like 35 or 40 years. And um, they just uh, put out a release a couple of days ago um, that they are part of an investigational 
uh, trial that the FDA has just approved. They're one of a handful of blood centers around the country that is um, using this convalescent plasma from people who have already had uh, COVID-19 and uh, looking at the antibodies that uh, may provide passive immunity. I'm reading from their press release because I don't, some of this is over my head. Uh, but um, it says that uh, the South Tex Texas Blood and Tissue Center is one of only a handful of centers in the nation that have the ability to test this kind of collected plasma to determine the concentration of antibodies. Um, and they talked about uh, this being a partnership between BioBridge Global and Austin-based XBiotech to develop a clinical test to identify natural antibodies against the virus in humans. So that's another example of leading edge science that's directly you know, emergent from the FDA in the last couple of weeks, uh, along with the work that Texas Biomed is doing. So um, you know, Larry's concept about team science is, is a, a major concept in San Antonio. We have so many different uh, institutions and they're working together and collaborating and uh, with Texas State and other, you know, organizations around the, the uh, state as well. So, FYI. Thank you, Ann. Thank you. you know, it, it also for those of you that are on the call, uh, we have been running a special edition of uh, COVID-19, and we've been trying to gather as many resources as we could under that Wednesday edition. We're archiving them on our website. So what we've tried to do is pick a number of resources that companies and individuals could go to, uh, for example, how to contact the governor's strike force, things of that nature. And uh, uh, if you go to thbi.com, uh, hopefully you'll find some useful information there uh, that you could use as a guide tool to help navigate uh, through this uh, with your company. Uh, but Ann, we've got some amazing talent and we have some amazing companies that have stepped up to the plate uh, during the COVID-19. Uh, it has just been, uh, it's been an eye opener uh, in terms of, of the companies and the talents that we have uh, here in the Lone Star State. We have another question that came in. Um, Larry, this one's for you. You mentioned that diabetics can have particular trouble with COVID. Are there any yeah. other groups or patients or diseases that leave patients immunocompromised that are particularly susceptible to COVID? Yeah, uh, so a great question. Uh, let me say a couple of things. What's become obvious with the outbreak is that we have a large percentage of people have no symptoms or mild symptoms, uh, upper respiratory symptoms. You know, coronaviruses have been uh, seasonal uh, viruses for, for a very long time in humans and cause colds up to 30% of upper respiratory infections are thought to be coronavirus. Um, but then we have a subset of people who uh, get really sick. Uh, and uh, this raises very interesting questions for us, thinking about the so-called pathogenesis, how infection begins. And there's one uh, receptor for uh, COVID uh, that's been identified uh, called ACE, or the ACE2 receptor. And uh, there has been some provocative links between expression of the receptor for the virus, which enables the virus co to cause infection, and diabetics. Uh, and there's also a little bit of anecdotal on hypertensives um, as well, uh, but more with diabetics. Um, but other groups, such as those have underlying lung disease, uh, are particularly susceptible to any upper respiratory infection. And we're seeing that in some of the people who go on the ventilators. And we still don't know whether uh, some of this virus is getting into the deep lung and causing uh, an uncontrolled pneumonia. Remember, our bodies haven't seen this virus before. So the body's immune system kind of goes wild and itself can cause a lot of problems. Uh, and then again, like the uh, influenza uh, uh, pandemic back in 1918, maybe it's secondary bacterial infection. And we're going to learn more about the way COVID might be hurting the lungs and setting up the lungs for a bacterial infection. Um, I don't know if my colleague, Dr. Turner, has anything more to add about this or plasma or any of the science parts that have been raised. Uh, I, I mean, I can reiterate some of those uh, health problems that are linked to increased susceptibility, and, uh, but also highlight that even though we hear about individuals with heart disease and diabetes, uh, or even the individuals growing older being susceptible, this isn't something that's exclusive. Uh, 
um, our younger generation are also very susceptible as well. And so we, uh, we can't just assume that we're protected, uh, that everyone in our population has the opportunity to encounter the virus. Uh, and if they do, they, they potentially can become really, really sick. And so we should take it very seriously at every age group that we have. Good point. We have someone who commented also that cancer patients are often immunocompromised as well. So the connection to cancer is, is strong. Absolutely. Anyone with what's called immunocompromised or a weakened immune system, remember what causes fever after an infection is not the bug, it's our body's immune system. And if the body's immune system is normal, you get some fever and you're over it in seven to 10 days if it's a virus. Uh, but if your immune system is weakened, you may be quite susceptible to a variety of infectious diseases and COVID-19 would be one of them. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's an interesting, um, that, that's an important point to make, to make. It does not like we have, look like we have any more questions from the group chat. I don't know if anyone um, who has access to video um, wants to ask a question, they can, un you can unmute yourself. I use the opportunity to make one other observation for the audience, and that is that there are some of us who are saying, you know, look at the countries that have a lot of COVID-19. It's not a usual pandemic because Africa and Asia, uh, they're starting to report cases, but they didn't lead in this pandemic. And, uh, and for those of us uh, who study uh, tuberculosis, these are populations that are vaccinated against tuberculosis with something called the BCG vaccine. And you're gonna see in the newspapers this interesting potential link between protection against COVID and either tuberculosis infection or vaccine for tuberculosis. And now there are some researchers actually studying that. Um, uh, and I think that's an intriguing new aspect to the science of COVID-19. So, I mean, this is just beginning. I mean, we're just learning more and more about this virus. All right. Well, I think this could, this, those are some good last words to end our, uh, to end our uh, WebEx with. And uh, Larry, thank you. Uh, Joanne, th thank you very much. Lisa, thank you for your help in organizing this. And uh, we ask you to stay safe, wash your hands, and uh, stay home for the time being. Take care, you all. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.